The Thousand Mile Motorway Plan continued, with one of the most ambitious and adventurous schemes yet, to build the highest motorway in Britain. While the M1 took just 19 months to complete, the seven-mile Pennine section of the M62 would take nearly seven years. The M62 is the great sort of trans-Pennine motorway, and it is a truly magnificent achievement. Now, that's very rare in Britain to have a motorway which is quite mountainous in British terms, and a motorway, of course, where you get tremendously foul weather. Originally a packhorse route, the A62 was the only road across the Pennines connecting Yorkshire and Lancashire. By the early 1960s, it was gridlocked with lorries, and trade was being severely affected. In the winter months, vehicles could be trapped under 12-foot snowdrifts, and sections of the route closed for up to four months at a time. The purpose of the design of the M62, or the basic remit was to ensure that it was going to be kept open all the time and not be close to snow. In other words, they wanted a motorway that was going to be kept open for seven days a week, 52 weeks of the year, and never close to traffic. The Pennine section was to be by far the biggest challenge. Climbing to a height of 1,200 feet, it would mean blasting through rock to create a dam. The engineers would then have to build the largest single-span bridge in Europe, while the planned route for the motorway lay across a peat bog. It's not possible to build a motorway over a peat bog because it'll not support anything. And bearing in mind it's such a high moisture content, it's better to go through it in a boat, actually. And the contractor actually lost a series of machines in the peat. OK, they were recovered eventually, but it presented an enormous problem. The only way to start building on the bog was to remove the peat. How to get the peat out? The only answer was to work with a large face shovel using the underlying... All 11 and three-quarter million cubic yards of it. The only machine that can actually traverse it was the muskeg, the muskeg tractor. This muskeg tracked vehicle was light enough to cope with the soft, spongy ground and steep-sided clumps. The man put in charge of this challenging project was 28-year-old Geoffrey Hunter. He made regular appearances in many of the films that were made about the motorway. This job is different. The whole geography is against us. The weather conditions are against us. are extremely adverse. The Pennine weather was so harsh that few people lived there. Although only half a dozen people lived on the planned motorway route, it was to have a huge impact on their lives. Any project as big as this is bound to upset the line. One house was to become almost as famous as the motorway itself. Here, the carriageways were planned to divide. It's a shame, really, because there used to be a myth around for many years after the motorway being constructed that the farmer living in the house wouldn't move and refused to move, and therefore we divided the carriageways and put it round it. And that, in essence, sadly, is not true. In fact, the motorway was built around the farmhouse because the land on which it was standing was unstable and had to be shored up. It was cheaper to build two roads around it. The Wilde family were living there at the time. You <laughs> think of being diggers and trucks and people everywhere, do you? <laughs> Running past your window. They come on with the ukes, are they? The big wagons full of stone, and every so often there'd be a bang, and the quarry would go boom. <laughs> they brought you to death. Yeah, you never knew when they were going to be blasting. It must have been very difficult for the occupant, Mrs. Wilde, at the time. The only time I ever met her was because of complaints of dust, and I could understand that problem. The hall roads, pounded by heavy vehicles, soon dissolved into fine dust that choked men and machines and reduced visibility to nil. You could not hang your washing out because you worked from 8 in the morning until 8 in the evening, seven days a week. It caused collisions and delays and complaints from farmers some distance away that their crops were being smothered. It was pointless cleaning the house because it was just absolutely covered in dust. So I used to have to start cleaning the house at 8 o'clock at night when they stopped. We actually watered the formation to keep the dust down and to make certain that she and her family and everybody else could live there. Oh, 
The M62 was national news. Work went on seven days a week, and the site was inundated with visitors. Tourists came by the coachload on Sunday afternoons to watch as seven million cubic yards of rock was excavated to create the Scamandon Dam. Running on top of it, a 200-foot-high motorway embankment was being constructed. The original plan for the motorway cut across the ancient route of the Pennine Way and would have meant diverting walkers. But ramblers, including the Transport Secretary, Mr Marples, had objected. So a special footbridge was built across the motorway, allowing the walkers to continue their journey. Across Steenhill Cutting, the largest single-span bridge in Europe was being constructed. Covered in 70 miles of scaffolding to protect it from wind speeds of up to 110 miles per hour, in the Pennine winter, it was able to withhold the weight of 1,100 tons of ice. Nobody appreciates just how big and how massive that structure is because it's dwarfed by the vastness of the landscape around it. It looks just a small bridge spanning over a motorway in the middle of a cutting. The cutting is sufficiently wide enough to absorb the whole of the new Wembley Stadium. Put it in the middle of it, you wouldn't see it because everything around it is lost in the horizon behind it. The climate was probably the most atrocious thing that we had to cope with. The engineering problems and considerations one can make decisions on, one can't control the climate. Now, I'm an old man now, and it's 40-odd years since I took part in this contract, but the climatic conditions were the thing, probably, that are so deeply imprinted on my mind that man and machine had to endure, fighting the climate constantly. This is also the only place in the world where it'll actually rain if you can find it trouser the lakes. It's very simple, actually, to explain this. The wind comes down these valleys very quickly indeed. Rain driven in its path, it actually blows it uphill. It's terribly frightening when it actually occurs to you. And it wasn't only driving rain and wind at the time. It was dramatic drops in temperature. It was working in constant cloud. And when it comes down, it's accompanied by a dramatic... It was a matter of survival. Exposure can set in. Men then, and machinery, begin to suffer. Oh, the conditions were terrible. The conditions were really bad, even for me than the machine. I, when you went in there in the morning, you were cold. Next thing you'd look around and geez, you couldn't see nothing. And the only thing you could do was then stop. And somebody would come and rescue you, you know. And it was very frightening sort of work. I just went rain there, rain. It was like something like monsoons, like, you know. It's come down, it start off like and the next thing. You'd be, you'd be shivering in the cab. You'd be saying, well, yes, I hope it doesn't come in here. <laughs> oh, yes. There were days on end when you couldn't work. And you had to either sit in the cabs or in the rest huts, waiting for the rain to ease off. You just had to sit there. And literally, they ate mud, walked in mud, sat in mud and were aware of mud, and there was mud in the sandwiches. Whenever possible, because of these conditions, work was extended sometimes to 24 hours a day. If we could work around the clock under floodlights, we did, and had to. Day, dusk, sometimes clean through the night and round to another day. Keep going while the weather's with you, cause it... You didn't have very good lighting. You just had a few lights on the jib of the crane, and sometimes and you wouldn't be able to see a lot, but you'd manage it. And uh, that might be going on at 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning. And uh, it took a lot of skill on the driver's part, and it took a lot of skill on the banksman's part. There was a banksman on top directing you in, like, you know. Our jobs was concentration more than anything else. You know, when you were driving the crane, yeah. You had to concentrate or you could kill somebody. Touch wood, I never had a, I never had an accident. They had to give up work, I don't know, the second winter, I think, because of the weather conditions. Everything was bogged down, they couldn't move a thing. 
and I think they finished for three months. And then they came back with a vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> and it, oh, it was like bedlam. <laughs> but there again, you got used to it again. On October the 14th, 1971, in glorious weather, the project was honoured by a visit from Her Majesty the Queen. With the opening of the Scammerdon Dam, the Pennine section of the M62 was finally complete. The overall length of this Pennine contract was just short of seven miles, and it took seven million pounds to build, which is literally a million pounds a mile. And now today, you can traverse it in seven minutes. And it's ironic to think that people that go across it now never sort of really can think or envisage what actually happened in those days some 45 years ago. Man's great ingenuity and willingness to accept such enormous challenges has brought to a successful end this Pennine project. <laughs>